Good morning. Hi there. How are you? Almost afternoon, but beautiful day out here. It it looks pretty nice out here too. There's blue sky. Yeah. It's, it's not a, it's not too cold. Um nice. We there we go. Um, oh, Jeff just walked away. Okay, let's let him come back. Um, Um, okay, so, um, hi, everybody. Um, so the first thing we should do, um, is, uh, review the minutes from the last meeting on February 7th. I sent them out yesterday and Stephen sent me some small corrections. Then I sent them out again to the entire library building committee with those corrections made. Um, is there a motion to approve those minutes as corrected by Stephen? I move that we approve the minutes corrected by myself for the second. Okay, all in favor? Dalmas, aye. Quackenbush, aye. Antonellis, aye. Okay, um, <clears throat> that was easy. Um, okay, um, great, okay, good. Um, so it looks like, uh, everyone we're expecting to be here is here. Um, Andrea and Heather said that they might have to be at a MBLC event today. So I think that's where they are. Um, so Dominic, I'm going to make you a co-host. Great. Thank you. Um, um, just to check in is, um, the police chief going to join oh, today? Let me, let me text her again. No um, and, um,
Okay, she's going to... Um... Um, she's going to join. Um, so we'll just give her, um, Great. a minute. Let's see if she, okay. She says standby. She's going to find the link. Um, so do you want to start? Yeah. I organized okay. the, the okay. presentation Okay. Start with her and then I figure we can let her go and then we can get into yeah. okay. the design Terrific. committee okay. items. All righty. Okay. Dominic, can I ask a question while we're waiting? Sure. The uh, door that has been removed from the meeting room. Yeah. Is that now a blank wall? Correct. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, when I think of the uh, uh, plan of that room now. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking there are some blank wall spaces, not huge, but if if you're going to use it for exhibiting artwork on the wall, mm -hmm. those smaller sections mm -hmm. of wall would be good to be able to direct light to. And, mm -hmm. you know, because I know there's the permanently mounted screen, but then each side mm -hmm. of that, I think there's several feet. <laughs> and then um, even that... Um, <clears throat> You know the section, um, the the this one here. Yeah, that wall, and even mm -hmm. even between that door and the door into the storage room. This one um, here. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just hoping that um, you know the track lighting uh, can be adjusted to to wall graze. Yeah, to yeah. to graze those areas. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So initially. We were considering this as a dedicated display wall. Uh -huh. um, and we, with the track lighting in the ceiling, we have this zone, which is kind of the presentation area. And uh -huh. that is zoned specific to that area um, where we have wall grazing that can be controlled as, as far as how this, uh, we do have the screen. So it's not so much wall grazing on this wall, but more um, highlighted lighting in this area. Um, mm -hmm. But we can coordinate with our lighting consultant about grazing these two walls as well. We already have specific zone lighting for that function here. Um, and we have a strip light in the kitchenette underneath the overhead cabinets to kind of offer specific lighting there. But as far as hanging space, yes, we can, we can include that. So I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Um, so with the screen here, again, were you considering just to confirm you're considering this as well as hanging? Either side of the screen. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can evaluate that with the screen. I don't know if it'll be too busy, but um, okay. yeah, we'll have a look at that. So Kristen is here now. Hi, Kristen. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, and Dominic. Oh, and, and Officer Charlie is here. Um, so um, uh, and so Dominic has some things to show you and some questions to ask. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, thanks for making the time to meet with us. Um, we're excited um, for the project. We're in uh, the, the middle of construction documents at the moment. So we've got about another month and a half left before we issue um, for permitting. And we're looking to start construction um, end of June. Um, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to have a look at some of the site plans and the building plan um, for your review and comment. Um, today's meeting is a sub-design committee meeting, so I would like to focus with you first, um, and then we can let you um, jump off the call and, and we'll get into our section thereafter. Um, so I'll go straight to the plan just for a quick reference. Can everybody see that okay? Um, 
So this is lot 032, um, and we have uh, Leverett Road to the right here. Um, in blue was our initial schematic design scheme. Um, so the outer line was the limit of work line, which was more extensive, and um, the larger building then was located here. We have subsequently reduced the footprint of the building itself and then also the limit of work where it's it's a real balancing act on this site um, with regards to wetland resources. Um, you can see here in the dark gray in this site, um, we're constrained with um, uh, with those um, and um, buffer zones. So um, the entry driveway from Lever Road is, is near the um, neighboring lot line um, it, it turns to a line with where we were able to locate the building. Um, we have overflow parking mm -hmm. on the right um, shoulder here. It's two, uh, it's single lane, but two ways um, entry drive. We have a drop off area here, um, two handicapped spaces, and then the parking lot with a turnaround um, to get you back out of the site. Um, the let me zoom in here a little bit now that we have context for the site um so from the parking lot um we have a pathway um that hugs the um the drop off and parking areas the main entry to the building is here um and then we have a few egress points from the building um so main entry is here, egress from this main lobby again to the western side of the site is here. We have a meeting room with a single egress door leading you out to the western side. We have revised recently, um, we've reduced the, the exit doors from the meeting room. So this door we do not need anymore. So we will not have this small little footpath or door, um, but we do have this pathway leading to these other two. Um, exterior doors. Um, I will get into the building plan shortly, um, but we do have adults and children's collections in this part of the building. So adults has an egress door that leads to this pathway and children's has an egress path, that um, door and pathway. So the, these are not primary entry points to the building. Um, they're egress um, at this stage. Um, we have bike parking here. Um, I will go to the next plan where we get a better sense of some of the site elements as well. So this is a planting plan and you can see here we have, um, uh, we're going to have a water well, which is located up here. Um, and we have the septic leaching field located here in the front of the site. Um, these other hatched zones, uh, um, uh, stormwater basins. So that is helping control um, stormwater runoff. Um, so other than that, you see a general um, layout of trees and plantings. So it will be vegetated site, um, primarily grasses. Um, we will have shrubs, um, uh, planted throughout and then some um, trees as well. But generally, you will be able to see the building from Leverett Road. Um, the septic leaching field is going to be elevated. So it'll be um, six to eight feet from, from Leverett Road. Um, and that'll be kind of a, a plateau grassed um, leaching field here. Um, but other than that, visually um, sight lines, you know, to lever it um, from the building uh, is possible. And, and then on the approach, the building definitely opens up. Uh, so that's the site plan. Um, I'm happy to, to quickly run through the presentation. We can then go back to any questions you might have, or feel free to, to jump in as um, you may have questions. Um, moving now to the um, building plan. So um, looking at the building again, similar orientation. So um, Leverett Road is to the right, which is north. Um, so entry is made 
under the entry porch into a vestibule and then an open lobby condition. Looking left, we have the main meeting room, um, which can be closed by two glass sliding doors. Um, and then we have some service spaces, the electrical room, a storage room for the meeting room, and the book drop and a small storage room here. We do have an integrated kitchenette, which is open and a part of the meeting room. Um, the meeting room has glazed um, floor to ceiling uh, exterior wall condition here with that single egress door that I was talking um, about earlier. The lobby condition is um, glass doors with um, mm. glass side lights, um, so good views in and out. Um, and then looking to your right, you have reception and browsing, accessing the two restrooms, um, gender neutral. And then um, moving on into the circ desk area here, um, that's the main reception desk. Um, we have teens room, and then we have support spaces again, staff work room with a storage room. There's also a water service room here. Um, we have interior glazing condition at the circulation, at the um, staff work room and the teens room. So there's good visibility through these spaces within. And then we also have exterior window, staff workroom, and the teens room. So um, we strategically put this um, center to the space so you get good oversight through the building and also exterior. So um, the staff members sitting at the circulation desk can actually see out and, and see cars coming in and, and foot traffic kind of making their way into the building. Um, moving then into adults, you have a, a small assigned computer um, adults computer work table here um, and then we have some collection shelving so there's book shelving sent to the space um, uh, half height so they're four high um, about four foot tall um, and then we have integrated uh, bookshelves in the walls there's a small um, study carol um, condition here which has full height glass and then we have a reading nook um, that is really a continuation of the adult space. There are no exterior um, windows here. Um, before we get to the reading nook, there's also the director's office with a window and a glass door. We have a seating area here. We um, decided to play with the building massing and the form. Um, we have a notch condition here, which allows the adults space to have great views out and northern exposure there's a full height glazed exterior wall here um, with this egress door um, and then we have a study room which is enclosed but um, a glazed wall condition and they have an exterior window as well um, and then the threshold into children's room we have another sliding door this is a glass sliding door um, and then getting into children's again, we have bookshelves nested with within the the um, this western wall, some stacks um, central to the room. They are low, um, and then we have these smaller uh, rooms off the main space of children's, but still open, um, uh, with wall, uh, wall nested bookshelves, seating in this one, and some more shelving located central. And then again to the north of the children's room, it's full height glazing, floor to ceiling, exterior door. Um, we do have clear story windows here. Um, they're at about uh, five feet up to the ceiling. And then we also have a, a clear story glaze condition here. Um, so I have some images, so um, it might be a nice way to describe the building. I can show you some exterior renderings. Um, this is a view um, from the entry drive um, coming to the building. Um, so you can see here, this is the drop-off and the, and the two handicap spaces here. Um, the pedestrian footpaths um, and then the building itself. So it's going to be clad in slate shingles um, primarily and then Alaskan yellow cedar um, shiplap boards in um, highlighting the entry condition here we have standing seam metal roof 
It's an offset gabled roof with photovoltaics. Um, this uh, this project is going to be net zero, so it's going to be a it's all electric building. Um, and um, you can see here, this is the clear story. Children's um, uh, window, the, the north-facing children's floor-to-ceiling glass wall. This is the study room. And then you have the teens room um, with a, a large window there. And this is the entry to the building. So this is the northeast corner. And now stepping to the northwest corner. Um, so again, looking at the children's glazed window condition, you can see that egress pathway there. Um, this is the notch condition in the plan that I was describing before. Um, finished again with Alaskan yellow. You can uh, cedar. You can see here the clear story glazing and the adults room floor to ceiling um, glass wall condition. Um, this is the staff workroom here. Um, the lobby egress door, those double doors, is is here. And then you can see in the background the meeting room, um, floor to ceiling, um, glazed condition. There's the suggestion of the, the pathways that you can see here. Um, this, this actually isn't going to be a pathway per the plan. Um, these two egress points are going to be made around to the south. This door will have a pathway that leads you up and around here. Um, some interior views. This is a view of the meeting room. Um, so looking to the to the southern presentation um, wall, we have the screen. And again, that glazed condition with the door to the right here. This is the kitchenette to the left. Um, standing at adults, looking, um, looking towards children's. Um, this is the director's office to the right, the reading nook um, that you see there off to the right. Then you have uh, the stacks central to the space. This is uh, the study carol um, with a glazed condition here. And then floor to ceiling glass and the egress door for adults. This threshold here that I'm highlighting with my cursor would be the sliding door that leads you then into children's room. Um, this is a uh, mass timber building, so glue lamp construction. Um, we're exposing the roof girders um, and wood decking. Um, we've got acoustic baffles here with um, uh, track lighting up in, in these structural bays. Then stepping into children's. So again, um, collections um, housed in the walls, some central stacks. This is one of those um, side rooms for children's. You can see the clear story glass up high. And then again, the view north. Um, eventually, you would see Levitt Road in the distance there. Um, this is an exonometric of the, the plan again. So you just get a sense spatially, um, the layout of this um, project. We have some exterior elevations um, that we can go through um, very quickly. Again, the east elevation here, this is the elevation, the entry um, is via these two doors, teens and the study room. Um, the west elevation here, you get a better sense now of the meeting room glaze condition. This is the lobby exit double door. Um, south elevation doesn't have any fenestration. The north elevation here, this is the children's um, floor to ceiling glass. And then this is the adults um, uh, exterior fenestration condition um, in the notch. Um, I wanted to bring up this site plan again, um, really just to um, one of my questions I had was the evacuation assembly area that you might consider for this project. Um, we've been um, meeting, we're looking to meet code as far as um, site lighting is concerned. So we have lighting bollards um, that illuminate the egress pathways. 
we were considering that um you know emergency assembly area muster point would be somewhere in the parking lot um we're going to make sure that we provide sufficient uh parking lot lighting with these poles so we have um site lighting poles shown here with these ex10s um we are not showing any lighting on the entry drive we don't need that by code so i just wanted to mention that um and get your sense my understanding was there there may be intent for some security cameras um so we can go back to the exterior elevations or the, the um the renderings to get a sense of that um, gabled roof, you know, mounting points. In some projects, we've mounted um, cameras on on site poles, on the um, uh, lighting poles. So um, just wanted to um, get a sense from you, um, some of those considerations. Um, that was all the slides I had. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions and go back to any of the imagery that I presented. Well, first, I want to say what an amazing job you're all doing on this project. And um, I so much appreciate you taking into consideration some of the safety concerns um, that we would have. Looking at the um, format of the building, uh, first, I want to say that I love how streamlined it is in that if we did have to enter the building for an emergency, it's it's pretty streamlined and we would not be having to worry about corridors as much. Uh, I think the appropriate places are uh, illuminated via the windows. And I love that you uh, took into consideration not having uh, window space for certain areas. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's a great protection. Um, so my concern for the cameras would be, and I think Marion and I talked about um, the cameras, and at first I was just thinking, well, mostly concern would be the front of the building, but now with this notch area in here and having such uh, a space uh, viewable from the side, I really would love to see something uh, coming off of, <laughs> I'm pointing to the pictures, if you can see what I'm pointing no to, yeah. by the way. <laughs> I would like to see something on that um, north, uh, uh, yep, right there, um, pointing down towards. So we get to see on camera, um, you know, that beautiful space right there. I'm a little bummed, uh, Marianne, that we're not going to have a track going around the library because I could be walking out there the, every day. But um, <laughs> um, I'd like to see something there. And um, that would pretty much get the nice uh, view of the whole back of the building, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe with the bump out here, we might consider, you know, a secondary camera coming, you know, from both ends. My main focus was, though, that notch and then the front of the building in appropriate uh, positions there. Mm -hmm. So let me mark up as you talk. So yeah. um, a camera kind of... You, right. you had mentioned up here, actually. But um, I, yeah, but I see now that the way that it, the angle is that the yeah. more appropriate spot would be right at that angle, That's sort of point. just yeah. uh, sort of facing down that way. Um, and I, there are different degree angle cameras, too. So I'm wondering, you know, do we do a 180? Or, you know, um, or is it really just this zone? Um, you, you might be able to catch something. Yeah, you know, well. it's that, and if I remembered your presentation properly, the only other window space would be the staff work room where there's mm -hmm. a small uh, window area there that I think the camera line could uh, detect. Um, mm. And then beyond that, um, I'm not, I don't feel as concerned about that space. Although, if we're going to do it, let's do it and make sure we get completely all around the building. Uh, but if we have to prioritize, I would say uh, that one area right there mm -hmm. and then in the and then in the front. Mm -hmm. um, so so those were concerns of mine. Um, you know, nothing, uh, no camera interior. Uh, however, I am. Uh, always concerned about the staff members um, and or patrons of the library. Um, and we might need to have a security system interior that Marianne or the staff could press 
uh, an emergency button to uh, get us immediate. And and that doesn't always mean that there's someone here I don't want, Marianne, I, I want you to make sure I you understand what I'm saying. If there's a legit emergency happening, sometimes it's faster than picking up a phone and trying to get service. Right. Like a medical emergency. Correct. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're planning a, a panic button at the CERC desk. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And, you know, when we had a, a larger footprint, we thought we might need more than one. But right. with this more, you know, uh, efficient uh, footprint, I think right at that CERC desk, which is centrally located, will do the trick. Right. And I think just um, with the camera system, I think it's important to let everyone know this isn't going to be something that's monitored by us at all. It's something that more is, you know, proactive and that people realize there's cameras there that sort of uh, keeps a lot of mischief at bay. But also that if anything were to happen, that we could get permission to look at the camera footage um, if we needed to, if there was damage or anything like that, just as the same as we do the school system. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think those are my main, my main points. If I had um, all the money in the world to spend on this, I'd like to go real high end, but I understand <laughs> we don't have all the money in the world to spend on this. Um, so, yeah, I think those were my main concerns. Um, I also really love uh, the entry um, an exit of the building um, and that there's an actual turnaround in there. I, I don't have any concerns with my vehicles um, being able to um, get in or out of that space. I was wondering at first why the entryway wasn't moved sort of more westerly, but now it makes sense that you're going to have the raised uh, leach field. So, um, yep. So that makes a lot more sense to me now. Um so I think that's a that's good and appropriate. Um, right. In the center of the turnaround, um, what's mm. going to be actually in the the center space there? Will there be light poles? To be plant, yeah, light poles and to be planted as well. So okay. Um, so one one thing I could say is if we had the camera system, it could attach from the light pole facing outward to the front of the building, and um, and you could get a nice wide. Uh, view mm-hmm. of the front of the building. Mm-hmm. So we have two right now, potentially, <coughs> if we were to get, you know, we could mount one here that might um, right. allow us. And that way you're not having to, we're not having to put them on the ends or corners of the building in the front. Um, mm-hmm. We just have something facing uh, the onset. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me that, that makes a lot more sense and gives us a much more, um, how many feet from that light pole to the entry of the building? Um, I think this is 20 feet. So we're looking at, you know, under 100. Okay. Yeah. So could be 80 feet directly. Okay. Yeah. And then an original question I had, uh, I think Marianne will remember this. Um, what is going to be, is there going to be something in front of the entryway? Is there going to be any high wall planning or pillars? Remember, Marianne, I was wanting to make sure someone's not driving into the building. Oh, bollards. Um, we have a raised curb that's only oh, six okay. inches um, mm-hmm. at, you know, the, basically adjacent to this concrete pathway. Mm-hmm. Um then we do have the light bollards, um, okay, these good, EX12s. Yeah. I don't think they are considered actual traffic bollards. But right. um, but I think the, with the raised curb, um, that's helpful because I'm not thinking necessarily malicious as I am somebody who might be having, you know, a medical emergency or those uh, older folks that, you know, are um, – sort of confused when they're when they're driving uh at times which we run into more than anything malicious so Mm -hmm. that might deter i guess is what i'm trying to say if you know they hit a bump like oh yeah yeah absolutely right yep that makes sense um we also have some boulders kind of in that turnaround and we will as well um on the exterior um okay to and just to to help with that um, I'm just thinking about this um, pole mounted camera and cost. If this was starting to get cost prohibitive, is there a potential location on the building um, that would suffice to, to, you know, to meet um, 
your requirements. I guess what's nice Can about this location again, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, what's nice about this location is you're catching this pathway, and then you. That's kind of, right. We would That's like right. to get as much of this. Um, so the rendering or um, the building plan. I'm just wondering if it was. Um, the where I can see, yes, that's perfect, actually. So I would say, um, I would say from the southern corner, south mm -hmm. southeast corner there, um, streamlining down the building, um, would uh, I think that would be very helpful. The mm -hmm. the team, uh, I don't know, um, your architectural word, sorry. But no, I call no, it teen, the teen bump out. <laughs> yes, no, that no, we've we call it um, bump out. That's great. Oh, look at me. <laughs> um <laughs> sort of like uh prohibits us from seeing further down the line, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So if we if if we could get two cameras off of that, um, you know, going mm -hmm. either direction, south and north, um mm -hmm. that would be helpful. I'm trying to think of all the ways, uh, because I do understand how expensive camera systems can be. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, if we're going to get them, we want a good camera. Mm -hmm. So if I was limited to just a couple, I would say corner, um, on either side of the front and the back of the building. If I wasn't as limited, I would say the, um, South East corner here, that, uh, Northwest area by the adult window, and then the two teen cameras, um, they're on either side, the, unless unless we can get that pole mounted camera, and that would actually mm -hmm. take care of the whole front of the building. Yes. I think, I yeah, think. I think I, I I would prefer to go on the um the yes. parking lot pole. That would be great, and I think I, you get better. I think it would be more cost effective than say getting three to four cameras for the front of this building. Um, yeah, that's just. And I just uh, know that from having helped with the camera system at the school as well. So um, that would be the most preferred. In right. fact, if we had illumination in the back of the building, but there aren't going to be any pole, poles for uh, looking in the back? No, not poles, but we do have bollards. So the, the, they're just going to be the this, this right. smaller bollards. Okay. Um, not tall enough, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. And um, and then I, I had, um, if we could step away from cameras for just a quick second, I did sure. have a question. I know you probably uh, explained this already, but the length of the, um, from Street Leverett Road in is how long? Um, the, the, um, the driveway in? Yeah, so to this transformer pad is 500 <laughs> feet. So, okay. um, you know, to about here is like 300. Okay. Have we considered um, at all any speed bumps? We have not, no. Okay. Um, that would be something that I just would consider gets slowing people down. We are probably going to be a very popular site. Um, this is, it's beautiful. And I feel that it's going to bring a lot of younger people and um, to the to the site because we now have really nice spaces. So um, keeping in mind the pedestrian traffic we may see, we might want to have at least one speed bump to slow people down mm -hmm. um, as they're entering with their vehicles. It just right. makes people go that much slower. I'm not sure how that would affect necessarily the plowing or anything of that nature. That's uh, above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but if I had my way, I would... I would I'd like a speed bump in there just to get people to slow down a little bit. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, one thing would be to um, uh, to check in with um, DPW, obviously with right. plowing, as you mentioned. I think the other thing as well is um, we've got a um, stormwater management, you know, grading on this side okay. and, and how um, stormwater collection happens on this entry drive, I think okay. is... Um, is very critical too. So I'm not sure if we can manage it, it'd be great to get a speed bump in. I'm not sure if that would be difficult to, to allow for the water to sheet off or to be okay. controlled to, to the drainage system that we have. So I just wanted to mention that, that there may be a few things that we have to consider for that. Sure. Um, and that for me is, is not a, a critical item. It's just a, 
sort of a thought in mm -hmm. um, getting people to be paying attention. I, I really think we're going to have a lot of foot traffic in and around the area, which would be great. So got it. Got it. OK. Um, and then our sense for the emergency assembly area. Does that make sense that it would be in the parking lot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. And if it were um, in, in if it were something that we needed people to um, move even further, we just start walking mm -hmm. them down to the roadway. It's fine. Th yep. That makes absolute perfect sense. It was something that I was thinking about uh, the minute Marianne asked me to jump on. So mm -hmm. um, uh, as I've been thinking about the excitement of getting the groundbreaking, we were actually just talking about that this morning in here. So oh, nice. um, yes, <laughs> preparation of, of, excitement so um yes that makes absolute perfect sense excellent um i'm happy to share this as well and any of the um we've issued design development drawings um at the end of last year so i'm happy to share any of those documents um just for you to to scrutinize some more if you need sure. and um, I think to that get would back be, to us. That would be great. Um, so yep. I can look at it a little bit more, see if there's anything yep. that, you know, I may feel uh, I could bring to you. So far, mm -hmm. though, this is um, very well, very well thought out for any of the, it's it's like you were in my mind for some things. Um, I love having a teen area. I love having a children's area, um, but I'm very protective. So of young people making sure that they are in safe places. So this, I think it's really well done. I think. Excellent. Thank you so, very much. Chief, oh. I have a, Chief, I have a question. Yes, sir. With these cameras, you're going to need, you're going to need the, um, the DVR machine someplace inside the building. Right. So Dominic, I don't know where you want to put Thinking that. electric. Mm -hmm. I think in the storage room. In the storage, yeah. Yeah, we're probably going to have a server rack in this storage room. And I think um, there's going to be um, uh, a fire panel in there as well for the okay. um, fire alarm. So um, that might make sense to um, have those things together. Yeah, that makes that makes great sense. And, and you did say that the emergency... Um, alert would be at the circulation desk not in yes. the director's office right good that's yeah, just so, centrally located yep we we have um specified them often underneath the counter exactly where the staff member or you know very close to where the staff member is sitting and so very easily fantastic. accessible fantastic yep. wonderful and uh, and not easy for necessarily the teens to get in and pull something that's right that's right. Yeah. So it's actually discreet. It'll be discreetly located, yes. I think, um, uh, underneath the counter of the desk here. Yeah. I think I think that's great. That was a great question about where we're we going to put that system. So I like the storage area. Makes sense. Beautiful. Great. Well, I'm certainly excited about uh, things starting to come to fruition here. Um, I don't really have any more input as of right now, but if you send me that information, I'll look at it a little bit more, see if there's anything that pops into my into my mind. But you've all done such an amazing job. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Marianne, anything else? No, thank you so much, Kristen, for coming and taking time out of your day. Um, and thank you for your support and, um, and, uh, and we will consider putting in a track around the library Thank um, you for your patrols. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just, I just, uh, I just got a walking pad for the office because I can't seem to get out of the office enough these yeah. days. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, there will be, there will be, you know, uh, just sort of a, a flat ish grassy area that people can walk across we're just not planning a walkway to, to save costs um, uh, makes sense it yeah. totally makes sense so, yes wonderful okay. thank you all for having me i appreciate it and if i'm uh needed marianne you know how to reach me i do thank you so much thanks Bye. everyone thank you very much right. thanks again right. appreciate it yeah. great so um moving on then um, so I just wanted to 
this is the agenda for today. So there's a few items here. I wanted to, off the top, just talk to some of these um, items that have been brought up over the last few meetings. So uh, regarding the retro plate, um, the retro plate again is um, a finish that we're considering where we used to have tile in the project. So that was the lobby browsing circ desk in the bathrooms. Um, and as a VE item, we were looking to use retro plate finish, which is a grinding down of the um, slab and sealing it. Um, and uh, we have consulted with our structural engineer. So um, it's a unique case in our project where we would be retroplating the structural slab that is installed as part of the project. So the slab will be fairly new and um, structural slabs crack. So I think I've made that clear to you that there would be cracking um, that would be visible um, after the retro plate process has been done. And it's something we've done on projects and, and we're very happy with. Um, I think though, after our discussion with the, with the structural engineer last week is that cracking happens over a period of years and the new slab will continue to crack um after the retro plate finish has been completed um as part of the construction process so um the cracks could form up to you know an eighth of an inch if not more a again it's something you can't control and it would obviously happen after the retro plating has been done so um i think knowing that and um I think that the biggest challenge with retro plate right now is managing the expectation um, for the building committee as to how this will look in the end. And, um, you know, we if we were to go retro plate, um, it would look great day one and then cracking would continue to happen. And I think there might, that, that would not be an issue for the structural integrity of the slab at all but i think um that you know it may be something that you would not like or it's a consideration um the other thing to note is that structural slabs also um get uh expansion cuts so there are um there are slab slab cuts that are exposed so if i go to the plan that we had up again um, we didn't have them exactly laid out from our structural engineer, but um, commonly they would, you know, be located every 25 or so feet. It's something like that. Um, and so, you know, we would have exposed saw cuts in the slab as well, and especially in this location here. And they can be, um, you know, quarter of inch to half inch deep. So, that's another uh, visual um, consideration for retro plating. Um, so with all that information, we're reconsidering whether we go retro plate and, and whether we go with resilient flooring. We have resilient flooring on the job. Um, there is many different finishes that we can go with, um, even concrete like um, resilient flooring, which we actually specify commonly on public project jobs. So um, we have materials that we like. Um, and I think just as to be able to really control the expectation of how the finish will look, um, we, are, we would advise going with the resilient flooring uh, finish instead of the retro plate. Um, we commonly do retro plate on a structural slab in a renovation, not new slab. So the fact that, you know, this is a new job, um, you would really prefer to do a topping slab over the structural slab to really then be able to mitigate this, the forming of cracks. Um, we're not going that road because it's too expensive. So um, that's, that's kind of the new information that we had for Retroplate. I see a few hands up. Um, I'm not sure who was first, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so how is the resilient flooring affected by the slab shrinkage? And secondly, how how does it, say, bridge the uh, 
Control joints. Yeah. Uh, no issue for both. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, the adhesive used for the um, resilient flooring and the fact that there is a little bit of give in the resilient flooring itself as a product, um, there, there will be no issue there at all. Your eighth inch that you talked about, is that laterally or is that possibly vertically? Uh, laterally, I think it's laterally. I think the depth of them varies. I didn't get spec on that. I was more concerned about how far it opens up. Um, my sense is that, um, again, it can go quarter inch to half an inch deep, depending. Um, I know there's a lot of... Um, cracking that happens um i can get depth estimates from you um, no, no. yeah so, so you're not concerned about tripping That's no i'm not I'm tripping i think you know again cleaning you know it, right. those cracks will fill up it, again yeah. it's you know it's just a bit of a um they're gonna get darker with the age yeah yeah, yeah. that's right um and i think no matter how many images I show you or actual installations, you know, our condition will be different. And it always is that way, right? Did um, So we, unless you have a topping slab and then you're staining, you, you can do color polymers inside a topping slab too and the retro plate process in how you finish it. So you can really dial in, you know, a finished look, control what it looks like. We're not going that round route it's a lot more random um you know we would grind down to uh, reveal some of the aggregate and then i think the biggest unknown is how the cracking will look in the end and it's mm -hmm. something that we don't mind but it, it's controlling expectations i think and then you know the overall aesthetic and, and public image that you're comfortable with and what spaces are we talking about so that would be the lobby into the restrooms um, and then the circulation desk. There would be a threshold condition here between circulation and then adults. Um, so it's, that, it, it's that big center part of the building. That's right, right in there. I don't care about the restrooms if they crack. No, no, that's right. Um, and then again, you know, we would have a saw cut here. So there's already, there would be a delineation um, between these two spaces. Um, so. And what would you propose for flooring material? I, we, there's, we can go over when we do finished material review, but there, there's actually um, uh, some very nice um, concrete like um, a cool, uh, uh, resilient flooring products that we like to use. So um, maybe for the next presentation, we can go over what um, that might look like. Um, mm -hmm. We do have some interior renderings where we um, estimated that product. Um, so I can show you those. Um, okay. One other slide. question, acoustically. Yeah. Is there an advantage to the... Yeah, slightly. And I yeah. think um, also for traffic, it feels, you know, it's tactile, you know, perception. It feels a little nicer underfoot traffic mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Um, I think that what we like about exposing concrete is we love the raw expression of the material, right? So it's mm -hmm. a pure expression of, of concrete. And we always like to celebrate that where we can. And I think it's very appropriate in a floor. I think the only reason I'm steering you away from that a little bit is my conversation with the structural engineer about the cracks are going to keep happening. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be over a period of years. And and at some point, you know, we'll get a call from you and, and there'll be concerns. And, you know, I just want to manage expectation, basically. And we are very fond of the resilient flooring too. So, you know, I think managing, it's actually cheaper by a little bit. Um, I think we would be saving um, what is around four and a half thousand dollars if we go with resilient instead of retro plate. Retro plate is a little bit more expensive than resilient, but right. um, again, all of this is far cheaper than the tile. Um, and are you talking a sheet good or are you talking 
tails. Twelve. No, 12 a she twelve. good. Yeah, roll. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Penny, I see your hand, and then uh, Molly after that. Yes, I mean I I have seen the the concrete floor in the Irving Library, and I was pretty unimpressed with it. Both just visually, it looked as um it looked very industrial but it was very cracked mm -hmm. um that's just a comment but as far as considering other alternatives it would be helpful to me when you present this to the full committee to have not just like um, cost to put it down or install it in the areas you're considering but also longevity yep yeah. There were, my understanding, I'll confirm that it's around thirty year product. It's it's got um, a long life. Which one are you talking about? The resilient flooring. I think the retro yeah, it must be very different than what I have in my kitchen because we're pretty careful about tracking grid in, and it definitely is impacted by, you know, sand and and gravel on our shoes. Yeah, I'll I'll get those details for you as well, Penny. Thanks. Yeah. Um Molly, I saw your hand up earlier. My question was just about like, the lifetime of each project sure. too. Yep, yep. Okay. No problem. Marianne? I was just going to say that um that Matt has often, uh, Matt Odens mm -hmm. has often said to me that, um, that he, uh, and I'm sure that you're sort of thinking along the same lines, that he's not considering residential products. He's considering commercial products when considering finishes um, in this building and that commercial products have different uh lifetime expectations than residential products um do you agree with that dominic that's right yeah yeah um yeah. it's Agreed. a tested product in in our projects for sure and and i'll get you the actual numbers from the specifications of the products we're considering um jeff i don't know if you have other experience with resilient no. it's a very hard wearing product i agree with yeah we've we've used resilient on campus in the last 30 years yeah and, it and, and you're using everything. and yeah. you're using this in lobby situations where people tromp stuff in in their winter boots yep yep okay it's it's a different product than what you would have residential okay yep. i'd love to see it yeah and we'll um penny we will um, coordinate a meeting with the group as well, similar to the exterior finishes um, meeting. Mm -hmm. We'll do an interior finishes and we have samples that you can um, see and, and touch and stuff. So it's nice and it's helpful to see. I'll that. bring my boots. <laughs> nice. So that was the retro plate. I just wanted to bring that up. There was a conversation we had recently. Um, there was a request for... Um, to see how much it would cost to substitute the concrete pavers at the adults egress location. Um, we did the calculation for that and um, it is $5,000. Um, the complete scope for concrete pavers right now is 22,000 and change. Um, so that is, you know, these three locations, one, two, and three. Um, one caveat in in reviewing the cost estimate with um, uh, our landscape architects was that the unit price for the concrete pavers was on the higher side, and um, Stimson can specify something that is not, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have to have that same cost, um, still be hard wearing, um, so they were comfortable kind of reducing the. Um, the spec of the concrete pavers. Um, our cost estimate is always middle ground with their unit costs for um, elements. So I just wanted to provide that number. It's about $5,000 currently. Um, if we delete that, 
um, there would be a minor ad for the bitch um, bituminous to then um, take its place. Uh, Penny? How does that factor in with our thought about doing brick fundraising pavers? Yeah, I, I think that's a great, I think that's a great um, uh, thing to do. Um, we, we've seen it done on a few projects actually. And, and um, uh, we are still coordinating with Lance, our landscape architect on font and, and um, uh, just the spec to actually engrave pavers. So those that are, you know, making donations, they get their own paver and they can engrave it. Um, and so um, we're still working through that. So um, are you talking to Greg about that? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, so is he, has he worked with companies that do that kind of thing and he'll be making recommendations to us? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's I'm, really great. Okay. Yeah. I, I believe on those that can do it. Yes. Um, he okay. has, um, on previous he has experience specifying how to engrave these pavers. So I'm getting okay. as much information from him as possible. Um, if he knows of, you know, where you can get this done, um, you know, in Massachusetts, that I'll get that information from him as well. So are you talking and, about engraving concrete pavers or brick pavers? Uh, you've been talking about brick. Are yeah. you talking about concrete? Yeah. Precast right. concrete pavers. Hmm. I've never seen it in a great precast concrete paper. Huh. Okay. I mean, I, I have seen brick walkways that are engraved right. at a number right. of libraries that I've been to. Right. Uh, and one one that OEA worked on the um the Martha's Vineyard Library. Mm. Um I believe I'm not sure. I'll get all the information um, okay. for you, Jeff. But I think it has to do with the dimensions that, that you can do it. You know, if they're too small, it's not going to work on the concrete. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll get as much information as I can. I'll get that to you. Okay. Um, so that was the precast. What else do we have? Oh, technology scope. Um, Stephen. You had a question about um, scope of work. Um, so our contract or the, the the scope of work from the electrical engineers to provide power and um, uh, all the cable conduits, not the cables themselves. So it'll be pull strings and power at all the locations where we have um, tech requirements, screens, computers, um, They'll have pull strings in that way when you make the purchase for all your technology, the um, subcontractor who's doing the installation will then provide the wiring and easily be able to make all the connections. Um, so that was that. Um, then site plan. So then again, I'm just going to start going through slides now. Um, site plan, building plan, some renderings, mill work, and then um, the restrooms. So um working looking at the site plan again we've been coordinating with all our consultants and we continue to do so as we're preparing for this 75 percent pricing estimate um i did want to mention that um, there's a code requirement for um uh charging stations um so this is um, labeled high efficiency vehicular charging station um we need to provide two stalls to meet code but um, it only needs to be charging ready. So we just need conduit and a pad, and then you can install the actual charging stations at a later date. Um, so it'll, it's just the infrastructure for it. Um, we'll need to provide two signs and um, we still have to work through coordinating that pad in the pathway right now. So, um, and why did you pick those two spots as opposed to the ones closer to the transformer? Um, so they usually they get priority. So <laughs> they get priority location because they're good for the environment. And, um, you know, uh, so in the, 
in the light of sustainability um you know it, it's all a push to promote electrical vehicles um so i dominic do we have to provide one of those as a handicapped ev um i don't think so um our electrical engineer mentioned it and i don't remember where that panned out my understanding was that we assign these to and it's not handicapped i'll confirm that do you know otherwise on other jobs my understanding is i know in my past job we did not need to provide for at the handicap store i think we've been we've been trying to make sure at least one of them yep shares a handicap spot so yep. that if it had to you would be close enough that you could probably reach it yep um but just i would just look into it that's yep. all I think our ambition, Neil, is to just be code compliant and and not look to put any more financial Understood. strain. But again, um, so I'll I'll make sure we meet the requirement. So currently, as laid out here, we would just have one charging station that serves the two vehicles. Yeah, one members. one post, two two plugs. That's right. right. Yep, that's right. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, we're also getting um photometrics done on the exterior lighting layer um, which we're going to confirm that we meet the light levels um, for the project um, related to the egress pathways and then the parking lot itself um, so that is underway i wanted to again just highlight um at the last meeting we were talking about um hose connections and having Can I exterior... ask a question about exterior lighting yeah okay um so will the exterior lighting ju just be motion sensor lighting um it's not going to be lit up all night it'll only be if somebody drives in it won't be motion censored it'll either be time clock or um photo cell so the combination of the two and um, that way you set whether you want them on after hours, whether there's a need for them. Um, I have to get into the details of how they're going to be controlled. Um, so my sense is you, you need some of them on for emergency, right? 24 hours to allow at least the parking. Um I don't think and, there's any 24 hour emergency lighting at the elementary school. Stephen or Jeff, do you know? I don't know. Yeah. All right. Know. So you'll find out what the code is. Yeah. I and, think we just okay. meet the code requirement right. and then okay. we'll go from there. And yeah. then we should have motion sensitive lighting um, for, you know, so if somebody parks just to go in and return books after dark, um, there should be lighting like we have that now at the current library um where if somebody comes in after dark and they open their car door a light comes on um so you know so that they can walk from the parking area to the book return book drop yep so, yep yep okay yep all right yep i'll okay. look into what we need to do okay. for that yep all right Okay. Related to that, where's the book drop? Is it in the, the it, out, is it in it, the lobby, lobby or outside of the building? It's on the outside. It's to the left of the entry vestibule. It's right okay. there. So it's captured by this paving layer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And underneath the um, overhanging roof. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yes, yeah, so I'll do that for you, Marianne, and I'll get okay. back to you. Yeah. Okay. Um. So with this plan, I just wanted to highlight the exterior um, spigots for um, uh, irrigation, just so you can do some watering. We currently own two locations. Um, Penny, we had discussed the potential for one to the north of the building. Currently, we don't have that scope. I just wanted to get a sense from you. Um, should we include it in the 75% cost estimate? to get a sense of what that might be, the infrastructure. Um, I'd I love to know what it costs. I'm just, yeah. 
you know, I've, I've helped take care of many gardens in town and I've lugged a lot of water mm -hmm. from buildings that have no water, lugging that many cans of, you know, watering cans yeah. of water as far as we're going to have is a big time sink and they're heavy. And yeah. most people doing this are my age, you know, in our, well, maybe 50s, but 60s and 70s. And um, I'd love to know what it costs. Certainly if it's yeah. out like this, we wouldn't do it. But having something, you know, on the on the very north end of the building. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So that's that's great. Thanks for clarifying. I'll, I'll make sure to include it then. A um, couple of other slight plan revisions. Um, again, this this plan as it's um, uh, shown here is really not being flexed too much at this late stage. Um, just some minor tweaks. We've included a window condition here at the staff workroom and adult computers. This was an MBLC request just to help with surveillance and oversight. Um, into the adults room from a staff member here. So we're including that and um, we've revised the director's office um, wall here. Um, it it was um, an interior glazed wall condition um, and we are now substituting with a solid wall. Um, it will be a glass door with a glass transom over the top. Um, and so we'll see some slight savings there as far as the interior glazing scope. Um, Mary, do you really want a door with glass in it so people can see you in there and bother you? Um, uh, I, I, you wouldn't believe how much I had a fight with uh, Dominic just to get a wall there. Um, so that was a whole glass wall mm -hmm. um, before. And now we're down to mostly a solid wall with just a glass door. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, so it'll be a glass door and we'll be able to put blinds on it. Well, why don't and, we, Dominic, why don't, think, we, why don't we frost the glass? You could do that too. I think that, I think that our sense is being able to see in and out, you know, transparency into all the spaces as much as possible. And I think that's the MBLC's stance as well. So um, I think a um, having blinds on the door is, is perfectly acceptable and a nice middle ground. I, I know that there, there's, there's often an ambition for privacy and that totally makes sense, right? You, you yeah. don't want to have glass like that all the time. Um, but right. I know um, right. also for security and, and other considerations, you know, to have that glazed, um, is also a consideration. Yeah, I think a glass door is fine. And Dominic, mm. most of the fighting I just did in my head. Um, so, uh, so um, I think it's MBLC really that that yeah, yeah. they have a no. I I, I actually think that their concern is more from the circulation desk, which is mm -hmm. you know th that staff person will be at that um, location. But mm -hmm. I think I think it makes sense to have a glass, you know, at least a glass window. And if it's going to be a window, it may as well be a full glass door. And then it can be a, a blinds um, mm -hmm. that be, can be closed when the library director does require privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, but I'm really happy that that wall is now a wall because that gives that room more flexibility and creates flexibility on the other side of the wall too. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, okay. Might be a donor wall right there. Um, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, minor tweaks here. Again, a lot of the coordination is happening with consultants. Um, Popla has been working very hard um, to get you some updated interior rendering. So we wanted to show you some of the work that we've been doing. Um, Neil, you had recommended that we revise the acoustic um, jip that we had um slated for this upper wall um we've been looking into products for um, fabric racked acoustic panels 
Um, we're going to wait for the 75% pricing as cost estimate to, to really understand the savings there, but we're happy to hold that for now. And so um, we've got some views of the interior. I just wanted to show you this section where um, the meeting room, the adults room and the children's room will have these acoustic panels um, that are going to be installed surface mount onto the drywall. Um, and um, the panels are going to line up with the structural grid. So the roof girders will suggest the um, the um, butt joint between these panels. Um, so there'll be a nice reading of that. I think the height lends itself well to vertical placed panels. Um, we had to um, hold back and not go down a, a rabbit hole of um, some cool design work, which is available, but we're really just trying to um, save some money here. You know, you can get different colored panels and get different shapes. And we were interested in investigating that, but I think at some point we realized that's more money and we decided to hold back there. Um, again, this section is suggesting an initial um, attitude about how we may paint um, a color scheme for the project and how we may paint some of these walls um, specifically just to um, the the wall on grid line two, the kind of spine of the building and then um, allow that color to wrap into these um, little niches. So this diagram here, this line is showing the interior space. So this is a plan diagram of what we're looking at in elevation in this section. Um, so the green color would go from the circulation. And again, the colors themselves are representation. Um, uh, they, they by no means mean the final color at all. Um, so um, yeah, that, that paint color would start in the circulation space and then go into teens. Um, the adults and director's office could be this color into the niche and the um, study room. And then the children's could be a different color. Um, we decided to pull the color out of the meeting room. Initially, we had color there as well. Um, so again, it can go back in. This is our first view, but um, we felt that potentially with the chair and the floor, um, uh, you know, there's still room here for color. I think the biggest thing for us in our consideration here is making the kitchen and play down the sense that there's a kitchen there, the kitchenette. So if we do a color, it just didn't feel right to have a white kitchen. It, it really makes it pop. Um, and then, or to color the kitchen. Um, you know, there's still some more study to do here. Um, but we wanted to give you a sense of the resilient flooring, um, having these fabric wrapped acoustic panels up high. We have an indirect linear light at nine feet and that is a lighting condition that continues throughout the building and so this um, provides indirect lighting up to the ceiling um, this is a revised view where we don't have the door anymore and so Stephen to your point um, you know this is a suggestion of what the screen might be that it, it all depends on what size screen you end up purchasing as to how much real estate you might have left and right um, for hanging space. Um, I think there's this image is a little bit washed out, so you can't quite make out the electrical room door, which is here, but we do have wall space on either side. And again, the wall to the right um, is dedicated gallery space or a hanging space, I should say. Um, I'll continue through and we can come back if anybody has questions. Um, this is a new view you haven't seen yet um, from the lobby looking into um, browsing and um, library of things. Uh, this represents a revised uh, layout of the library of things, um, but it is finished in a white finish, which we had previously specified. Jeff, I know we had spoken about um, uh, a birch ply. So I think we would revise this again so that it represents the clear sealed plywood, I think is appropriate here. Um, 
but it shows here the metal shelving in its niche for the browsing section, storage above with uh, panelized sliding doors. So very simple, low spec enclosure condition. So it's not a, you know, a cabinetry door that swings open. You could do um, a sliding door on a track mm -hmm. and um, we can go through shop drawings that I have revised shop drawings and sections um, for this um, library of things. Um, restroom doors to the right with a bubbler in between. Um, and then you can see the circulation desk um, leading into adults beyond. The next view is from this vantage point looking back. So again, a new view um, showing the transparency through the staff workroom, um, the circulation desk, uh, some of the storage behind it, the self-checkout station. Um, Marianne, we'd like to get your thoughts on the printer, its location, whether you would be reusing what you have. Are you considering a new one? I think it's a very prominent location and it affects sight lines depending on what we end up having. Um, you know, if this were taller, it would impede view or obstruct view. Um, we can finesse the millwork housing this printer too. So we can have it sat down to, you know, be a little more accessible and not so obstructive. So it's something we can work through. Um, I'll take that conversation offline. Um, again, adults, computer space this is the resilient flooring one of the versions of a, of a, a concrete like um uh, uh resilient flooring that we could use here instead of the retro plate um so again this view to browsing and the meeting room beyond um just to caveat the act is a change from the acoustic we're still coordinating light fixtures here, so please disregard this misalignment. Um, still some work going on here, but um, just a view really spatially to give you a sense of this. It, it's a view you haven't really seen before um, and um, gives you a good sense of, uh, I think it's a nice juxtaposition of a compressed space, nine foot tall ceiling you know, and then when you get to adults turning around, you get that nice expansion in the ceiling and, and openness. Um, this is a view that I um, displayed for the um, police chief earlier. So again, the idea of the color um, strategy through, um, we have the cove indirect light here with acoustic panels on the wall. Um, and other than that, not really anything too new other than the director's office solid wall here. So, Marianne, this is a condition of the glazed door with the transom glass above. Um, I think you're seeing reflections here of um, the other interior space in the glass there. Dominic, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I have to drop off the call. No problem. I'll share the presentation. We can catch up later. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Um, and then the last image is of children. So um, we're testing what it might look like to have the shelving niche in a different tone. Um, we like the fact that this niche here allows you for um, display space and, and potential storage. So I think it's a nice elevated condition that Potentially only adults and staff can access, obviously, but, you know, strategically so. And um, but yet a good space for you to store. That's again, it's a color strategy that um, helps define that the use of this wall. Um, again, the color strategy moving in and out of um, these smaller rooms and again, the, the views um, out. Um, Moving on to millwork, I just wanted to get this in front of you. We've been revising the um, the circulation desk. Um, previously, we had a privacy screen. It was like a six inch deep, eight inch deep, um, uh, some eight inch tall or so kind of privacy condition that wrapped around. MBLC has requested for flexibility that we don't use that anymore. So it is a single surface um, counter. Um, with an integrated book drop. So it'll actually be a 
a countertop slot that drops in. So you can see here that drops into the book cart um, underneath the counter. Um, we've used a very similar condition at Norwell, which works very well. Um, and there's, you know, nice counter space here for patrons to put books before they do make returns. Um, we have a power grommet, um, a countertop grommet here for integrated power. So that way, previously we had an outlet underneath the counter, um, but uh, this is a flip top grommet. So it would be served by a floor box. So the floor box could be internally um, wired Oh, the floor box would be on the ground and then we would have the wiring that goes up to the uh, flip top grommet um, to supply power for the staff member as a computer here. Um, other than that, the layout is um, pretty much the same. Marianne, to the panic button location, I think it would be great to put here or here. Um, so it's under the counter and you could literally sit at your desk and just get your hand underneath the counter and, and find that um, visible from any staff from behind, right? It'd be a nice red push button um, that we locate there. Um, in section, I think it would be here where I have my cursor. Um, again, I'll um, circulate this presentation and you can um, go through it. Marianne, we may have like a, a specific mill work programming conversation with you where you want trash you know is it appropriate to have um the box files where it is and, and how you're considering the exact use of this table um just wanted to get these these revisions to you uh moving on to uh library of things starting off with the elevation so you know some minor revisions here potentially if this layout is not appropriate, we can go back to where we were. What we liked about this is we are able to integrate the telescope cooktop and incorporate these structural vertical elements here um, that are more appropriate for the spacing of the shelving here. These shelves shown in light um, uh, lines here are uh, flexible, so they're movable. Um, so you could actually pull these out and just have the um, the uh, coat hanger rod or the coat rod um, be installed and um, serve as as hanging the um, uh, life vests. So these can slip in and out. I'll quickly go to the section just to show um, the bracket the surface mounted bracket that allows the rod to be um, placed in it and then can be pulled out when you don't need that storage. And then these shelves can store. I think we would revise how we detail this end condition. So potentially these shelves can just stack down here when you're hanging um, life jackets. And then in the winter, you store them somewhere else and the shelves come back into play. Um so a little bit of a different layout here where the paddle niche is a bit bigger than what we had in the previous version, Marianne. So I don't know if this is, I think it would be appropriate to store the paddles, but then when you're not using them, um, you know, potentially here we can get some of these flex shelves in as well. So maybe we handle this in the same way we do that. When you have paddles, these shelves can be stowed away and then they can come back um, when you don't need the what, the Can you just paddle. tell me the dimensions of that spot now compared to the dimensions before? Yeah, I don't have, I don't remember previously. I know it was less okay. than two feet. So this is two feet currently wide. It's uh -huh. two feet deep. Um, and so previously, I think it was around 18 inches. I, I would okay. say it was a, a solid six inches less than this. Okay. Um, I, I can get that to you though. Um, okay. Jeff, I see your hands have raised. Yeah, what's the, what's the distance from the the rod to the fixed shelf where you're supposed to hang the life preservers? Yep, so the rods short. would actually be mounted on those wall brackets, on the side panel brackets. So all of these shelves are adjustable. Are you saying this dimension here? 
No, from the rod to the down section. to this one here. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is exactly. The intent was so that you have about um, well, it's under two feet. I can get that dimension for you, Marianne. Aren't the aren't the I, I'm going to measure the life vests again. I think I sent you measurements of the life vests yeah. hundred years ago, Dominic. I'll measure yeah. them again um, so that we make sure we have room for two rows Top to of bottom. life vests. Yeah. And so now, um, are we going to have like one, two, three, four, five, six small rods or? Yes, you will. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Yep. All right. A little bit, uh, it's not as efficient, but this rod, if it was continuous, would need some sort of vertical reinforcement, um, at least one, if not more. So um, this way, though, at least using these uh, panel brackets, um, you're able to you know, put those rods in and out. If you were to have a vertical bracket, they're fixed. Usually you'd have to unscrew it to remove the rod. So um, and the, maybe. Yeah. And the distance from the rod is one feet, five inch. This, yeah. So that's yeah. not enough. This rod is going to have to come up here somewhere. I think. And how, so how big is that top? section is that three feet 10 inches it's yeah complete okay so potentially okay. marianne this here can drop down a little bit okay. what i was considering it was placement and re retrieval of cooktop and telescope right and you, you can't have it too snug you know it would just be really difficult it'd be great to have a little bit of lift space right. here but potentially i can finesse this clearance a little bit and this okay. fix can come down a little bit. So I think there's a bit of room there. Okay. Yep. Um, again, the overhead storage here, very simple um, track. I think we have a detailed, oh, no. we're missing that detail, but it's a simple track system. Um, bottom and top, and then you just have three panelized. This can be, you know, very thin ply. Um, that can slide back and forward. Nothing fancy. It, it doesn't have to be. I think the intent really was just to conceal um, right. uh, storage niche there. So a little more refinement. Um, let, once we confirm the um, life vest storage here, I think the intent really was to balance um, the left and right and center, right? So um, previously it was offset to one side and the motive here really was to um, uh, provide adequate structural um, support for these shelves and then allow the, the hangers, the rods to um, be supported as well. Um, so that was that. Now the last thing is the... Um, restroom. I finally um, got a message back from the plumbing engineer, um, John Letourneau, who um, let me know that he's not comfortable in granting us a, um, relief to meet the code. He said that as a public building, um, he felt that there would be more scrutiny on this project and one that he was not comfortable in overriding state plumbing code. He understood the constraints on our project, um, he said, to meet the plumbing code requirement, um, we would only need to provide an additional restroom stall. So we've been scrambling with our code consultant and there's been some new information which we think helps us out a little bit. And what I'm showing you here is a plan where Per the code, we need to provide one toilet fixture for men's, two for women's. So previously, we had grown this um, single-use restroom so that it can facilitate 
being the women's and have two toilet stalls. Um, but the code does go on to say that per that requirement, you can also substitute the fixture requirement with just an additional stall. And if you provide two ADA stalls, like we already are, you would only need to provide a, a stall, a single use, gender neutral stall that is not ADA. And this is considered a cluster of restrooms. And that's how we meet that requirement. So we are clustering the restrooms together in the same zone within the building, um, whereby somebody who needs to use the restroom needs an ADA restroom, sees this one, you know, these are all considered a cluster. So our code consultant is comfortable that the spatial and that the the requirements for the restrooms is met as shown here. Um, what we haven't had time for is to really um, finesse what how the water service room and the storage room works. Um, what I've done effectively is grown the footprint of the building by um, I think it was a uh, hundred and twenty eight feet of square foot area here. And I have reduced the roof eave from 15 inches to eight inches. So we're playing, we're basically pulling our roof eave down to allow this to grow. And I think that's a better strategy than what we had at the front entry. Um, I think that the, the way that the, you know, the overhead roof is working with, sight lines and then suggested entry you know this is working well as laid out currently i think with this portion we have the continuation of the pitched gable roof right was was um covering the staff workroom and storage room you can see lightly underneath here where it was and we would just expand that so it would be the same pitch um so a bunch of things to work out. Um, I, I'm waiting on the plumbing engineer to really lock down what he needs for the water service room size. But I think there is room here for a bit of growth and, you know, a bit of growth in the water closet, potentially reduction in storage room. Um, what I don't like about this is that to get to the water room, to the water service room and the sink, the mop sink is that you have to go through storage. Mm. So it was nicer here. Um, but so we're still finessing this. We did have a look at a version where the water closet was located here and the storage room was here, but access into the storage room, you know, you, you could have two doors then, um, but it would mean that the building has to grow even more to facilitate entry the way that this closet is working out. So really everything in gray here needs a lot more thought. What you're looking at is a result of new news late yesterday and an attempt to work this um, hours before today's meeting. So um, I think this suggests that there's great potential to meet the code requirement. Other questions that you had previously was, would it incur an ad service from our consultants? And it would not, namely our plumbing engineer. I think there would be a slight ad cost for fixtures and some infrastructure. Um, what's nice about this layout is that we don't need a floor drain. Um, what's also good is that the septic leaching field is not implicated by this at all. So that septic leaching field is purely designed on occupancy, not fixtures. Um, and what's nice, Marianne, is that they can all be gender neutral. Um, so I think that is a big plus here as well. The, so other than this layout and really the, this is still awkward. Um, I, I wanted to, this is a bit early to show you, but I wanted to show you that there's potential to meet the code requirement and work within our footprint. Um, the big question I have is, and we haven't studied it yet, or another question is um, the roof eave. It's getting dwindled away. And so do we go to an eaveless roof with a gutter? You know, the, 
the it needs more so it needs more review from us um as to how that works so um we're scrambling to to study this and get something appropriate for the 75% um as it, it it's really in our court um for OEA and and we need to get the plumbing engineer um coordinated around where this ends up so it'll be a busy um week or so we need to get it to them soon um and i think that was it from a high level i see a few hands up um jeff oh i'm a little confused how many what fixtures are going to be in that room that you call rest yeah it's going to be a toilet and a sink a toilet and a lab yep yep okay yep um so again this is laid out very high level we need to get it into our actual model and really finesse this but the way this is laid out there is room to grow slight you know it's going to come down to inches and and that's how the whole project has been designed but there is room here to 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 facilitate the needs for this um the big thing is we don't need to be ada for this mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Marianne. I love this, Dominic. Um, and uh, and we can work with the um awkward access to the water room and a little bit of reduced storage. I much prefer three single occupancy restrooms, um, if that's what we have to have. So thank you so much. Um no problem. I think this is a much better solution. Yeah, than previously agreed. Yeah. And it was it was premature of me to show you there was pressure to at least offer some suggestion that we could meet the code i think now that we know that we don't need to provide an ada stall as the third is um very helpful um yeah so th this is where we're heading right now i think to not complicate the entry and um Again, I think it, it requires some study on our end as how this roof is working in the end. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in my mind about the um, Alaskan yellow cedar shiplap boards, the the structure, the the rafter tails, right? The structural roof rafter tails. Do does that all get cleaned up and taken off the job? You know, do we have a a, a minimal Eve condition now, but we have a continuous gutter around the whole project. So there's a lot of things kind of at play and um, it requires a bit of study. So um, it, it's going to take us a little bit of time in our office to, to work through all that stuff. But I think um, in light of you this requirement, we, we, we should be okay. Um, I think we do. Stephen. Yes. Um, it does it would the cap code allow assuming there's the space to have a door from the restroom into the water storage mm. i think we would be struggling to get the fixtures in with a door um so yeah that's a good question um i think well the this restroom would definitely have to grow and that would come at expense because we need to mount a sink here and then the toilet is here. And we, again, we're playing with every inch we can. This is going to be the tiniest restroom you've ever seen, but it'll meet code and it'll work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, getting a door in um, will change how this works. Um, I, I would love to have the water service room, you know, more accessible or direct access but again how this door you know i was reconsidering what we have for a door here because that door swing is also in conflict with that it's just it's not common practice right to to put a door swing in front of another door so it, that just is a bit awkward um so again a little bit more finessing required again i wanted you know it's hot off the press um and uh, a lot of work has to happen back of house, um, but I think promising nonetheless. Um, 
that was everything I had today. Um, Marianne, I know we have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, is it tomorrow or Friday? I forget. Um, I know this week, I think it's tomorrow. Um, and uh, for lighting, uh, for um, electrical power plan, yeah, it's electrical review. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was it for, for this week at least. And and then we have a meeting with Mass Save on Friday, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Um. Okay. Penny raised her hand. Hey, Penny. Hey, I have um one other thought. Going back to the community room, mm -hmm. um, the door into the electrical, and this goes back to Stephen's question about uh, maximizing wall space. Mm. now uh now that you don't have a door on the south an exit door on the south end would moving the electric access door closer to the wall give you um a more unbroken spot of yes um, central gallery wall it would there would be an increase it would be better use of this wall space. That's right. I remember the reason it was there before was because there was a... Uh, and there. Because of this door. That's right. Just um, a small thought. Yes. It's a good one, Penny, and I think we should in, um, incorporate that. Um, Stephen. Um, getting back to the meeting room in your... Um thought about a neutral color, we'll say white, I think, you know, as an exhibition space, you know, white walls are the best. So I think that would be another reason to consider that in the meeting room. Yep, great point. Nice. Anything else from the group or Marianne? No, I think we're really uh, moving along and, um, and, you know, and I really like the new solution for the restrooms. Um, we do have a, a, a lane schedule, the building committee meeting, a full committee meeting on Tuesday. Um, uh, and um, do you want to put the schedule up again? Sure. Just, but the schedule is still the same. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to um, go out to bid in the middle of April. And then, okay. And then, so when are you sending off the... Um, 75. The 75, yeah. Yeah, March 15th. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then... March 15th. Okay. Um, and then, okay, good. All right. So we're looking good. So this group will meet again uh, in two weeks. And that is um, March 6th. Is that what everybody has on their calendar at noon? Yes, that Fine. works for me. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Anybody else have anything? No. Okay. No. Looks good, Dominic. Good. All right. Thank you, Dominic. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. No worries. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Appreciate it. And, um, and Portla, thank you for all of the wonderful images. They're really exciting to see. Dominic, will you send me these slides? Absolutely. Yep, um, yep. Because the, the slides are really... Um, a lot of fun to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Paul okay. did a lot yeah. this week. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.